Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Stephen Digna, Jr. He's a U.S. Army uh, uh, veteran, uh, disabled uh, due to an incident. Uh, he also uh, was a witness to a Raytheon Corporation event at Fort Irwin, California. His story is very involved. He's just going to give you a few of the highlights in the interest of time. But thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> I'm going to look down and read this. Uh, I have a brain injury, uh, so it gives me problems. So I apologize. My name is Stephen Michael Digna, Jr. Uh, doctor, I'm sorry. These are slipping my hands here. Sorry. That's OK. <clears throat> my name is Stephen Michael Digna, Jr. The following testimony is true and inaccurate as, as it can be at this time to the best of my ability, and I have prepared to swear this t testimony under oath before the Senate and Congress. <sighs> I'm a former sergeant in the United States Army. I began active duty service in 1999, and I served until 2002. I was assigned to the U.S. Army Training Center, W4J9 Alpha Alpha. Fort Irwin, California, located in the Mojave Desert inside uh, Death Valley near the Barstow, California in 2000. <sighs> I was assigned to Alpha Company Group, Live Fire Combat Engineer Division, uh, Computer Sport Systems, and uh, basically for civilians, it's management for live fire operations. I acted as a hub between the operations group, intelligence planners, ground team, Air Force, and Star Wars programs. Uh, thank you, Doctor. In July of 2001, I was observing a live fire practice uh, at eye level from an, uh, an observation deck at approximately three stories high from the desert floor. I saw a craft in the distance at approximately 200 feet off the ground, measuring 107, approximately 172 feet across, strongly, strongly remembers it, resembling a hovering B2 spirit. Upon first glance, my eyes were adjusting to the darkness. I could see seven lights in a V-shape. <sighs> After that, I closed my eyes for approximately 30 seconds to allow them to adjust the lighting conditions. We were running red lights throughout the bunker due to the current live fire uh, exercise. The range was hot. That means rounds are being fired and lives are at risk at all times. Uh, this was interrupted by a, a very, very ominous call. A net call it said, cease fire, cease fire, cease fire. It came from one of our observer controllers on the ground. There was about 20, 27 teams out there. Uh, and they, uh, they kept soldiers alive and trained them. <clears throat> Sorry, thank you, doctor. Once my eyes adjusted, I could make out the general shape of the craft. There were two men from Raytheon present. I pulled out my night vision goggles to get a better look at the craft. Uh, it appeared to be generating seven lights along its wings and underbelly. I noticed another smaller craft oriented on the right side at the, and at the same height as the first craft, approximately 75 feet to 100 yards to its right. The second craft was jet black, V-shaped, pointed towards the first craft. This craft had equally joined, spaced, rectangular sections forming the hull. The craft had a gimbal rack on, that deployed from the bottom of the craft, uh, approximately five to six holographic uh, lights. Uh, holographic emitting uh, lights were uh, pointed directly at the first craft. That was my assumption. Uh, due to the fact that they were displaying a strange color within my MVG goggles. Anyone that knows the old school, you know, two th circa 2000 MVGs, they don't emit color. They give you green, grays, and blacks. I was seeing colors within my night vision goggles. This was not normal. And uh, it was my assumption that perhaps these, this was a hologram being projected from the other craft. Uh, I can't confirm that. However, that was uh, my assessment at the time and my suspicion at the time. I wanted to throw a baseball at it but I didn't have one, just to see if it was tangible and solid. The second craft was uh, jet black, V-shaped. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, jumped a little space here. Thank you for the bullets, uh, Raven. The craft and the gimbal rack were deployed from the bottom of the craft and approximately five or six lights. Sorry, Dr. Greer. Guys, I, I, I goofed up, and that's a part of the brain injury suffered during the explosion on the live fire range. One of the two men on the observation deck, uh, observation deck from Raytheon Noticed the night vision goggles I had. 
He went from chattering cheerfully. Uh, they were pretty relaxed. They'd seen these before. It wasn't abnormal to them. Uh, uh, he looked at me with a very, very severe uh, look of disapproval and anger uh, that I had. Uh, at that point, we both, uh, they both went calmly inside, probably a little bit angry, and uh, it felt like as though I had crossed the line. I took another uh, look with my night vision goggles. The reason this event was not uh, reported uh, was due to the fact that it was not unidentified. I'm going to repeat this very clearly to the cameras. This craft was not unidentified. This was on our birds, and... Uh, to the observer controller that called that out on the range, I'm not going to put his call sign out. Uh, Roger up, eyes on, hands on confirmation. That's our bird, but she doesn't un need w wind to get lift. She was hovering stationary. Uh, this was, uh, I'm going to interject here. Sorry, guys. This was very dangerous. This, light, this craft showed up uh, un unscheduled. I got no notification. My job was to maintain command and control and to be the hub and uh, top observer controller for the Tactical Operation Consent, uh, Command Center for Live Fire Desert Warfare. That's the largest live fire warfare center for desert warfare on the planet and uh, in history. So uh, any, any moving objects that are on that, dinner, uh, on that desert uh, floor or in those skies are supposed to be coordinated between myself and another group uh, that I directly worked with, with the uh, civilian personnel through Raytheon and the Air, United States Air Force. Uh, so to get back to the statements here, uh, the reason this the event was uh, not re oh, skip. All right, well this is gonna jump in a little. I was the fastest promoted soldier in 25 years on the post, uh, and I was the youngest number one control seat holder uh, at Fort Irwin NTC facility in history. Uh, that held the title the Voice of the Desert. Uh, when I cued my mic at my FMB station, it shut down all radios, and I could shut down the, the range for safety reasons or for medevac calls, safety reports, weather reports, and any other thing that was commanded by me by my uh, superiors. Uh, <clears throat> I skipped over that, but I filled it in good. Approximately five to seven uh, days later, the <sighs> sorry guys, this is personal. Uh, this affected the rest of my marriage, my life, and uh, my relationship with my child. Approximately five to seven days later, following the following incident took place on Fordowin Road. It's the one road leading uh, into the base. During the weekend pass after the show, uh, my wife and I had uh, taken a pass to go see a movie. Um, and it, this, this took place right after the live fire bunker, about five, seven, five to seven days afterwards. We skipped the second movie, or halfway through. Uh, I was really tired, just got back from running the range. Uh, 78 hour shifts with no relief. We passed a dry lake bed on the right hand side. I've got that exact information already turned into the proper authorities. Thank you, Dr. Greer and all of his team. Um, people out there, please get ready to come out. There's a saying they got, an old, uh, old friend of mine, well, a new friend, but uh, he reminded me of an old saying they have at Fort Benning, Georgia. It says, follow me. There's another saying we have at the Signal Corps Academy. It's, uh, it's on the badge. It says, Propatria Vigilanus, or Vigilus. That means watchful of the nation. And there's another group of men that I served with, and I tried to keep them alive every day to the best of my ability. Same guys that blew me up. And I still love them today, and I ask for amnesty for all of the information I'm gonna hear, say from here on in is, uh, these boys are on the ground on the hottest spots in the planet, along with these other soldiers, and they're dying out there. They're out there killing people under false pretenses. I've also turned information in that may be able to prove that to the proper authorities, thanks to Dr. Greer and his team. His team so far has been accommodating, polite, honest, respectful, and this man is my new general. He leads the way. So rally up. Rally on me, this man is the way. He speaks the truth, he is sound. Apologize, Dr. Greer, I've been waiting to say that for a long time. Uh, I thought they would laugh at me and look at me like I'm a lunatic. However, I brought my data, I brought the, I brought the information. They stripped my information, said I had a driver's badge and a service ribbon. Uh, I had two accommodation medals and I had total seven certificates. They put me in for an ARCOM, which is the highest award you can get for, uh, for a non-deployable base. I'm a non-combatant. 
but I'm as close as you can get to being one. Those boys out there, we receive KIT reports every day. That means killed in training. Had I been in a real tactical operation command center uh, or bunker on the range, like the one that just got hit in Ukraine, then I'd be sending men out to die every day. Those guys hated the voice of the desert because we gave them the commands to send their troops into danger and to death, even if we knew that they were just the decoys for the real mission. So I'm gonna have to jump back to this. I apologize, Raven and everyone, for, for going off track, but that had to be said. Oh, roof. <clears throat> back to the story in hand. This isn't a story, it's my story. This is a real story. And uh, don't forget that. This is real. This can't be made up. And uh, I can give you the exact locations. I can drive Dr. Greer and, I, and all of the command, Congress, everyone there, to the bunker. So. We passed a dry lake bed on the right-hand side. My driver's side mirror reflected a powerful white light into my eyes. I saw a bright white light pop up of, uh, out of the canyon that I had just come from. I looked over my, my left shoulder and saw a zipping light <sighs> that zipped through the, the, the curves uh, in that bend, mimicking my exact, uh, my exact track and exactly the speed that I had had. Suddenly, all I could see was a bright light through all of my windows. And at that exact same time, my car's power steering and the engine's electrical system, everything died, completely died. Uh, when, uh, when I exited the vehicle, I rushed towards the front end of the car, believing there was someone pointing a floodlight at us. I had some words to say to that man. I stepped through a thick field of white plasma that encompassed, co encompassed a spheroid craft. As I turned to go inspect my, uh, the craft, my wife opened the door and she ran out towards the front of the car and she was yelling, Steve, no. She was instantaneously locked in place in a bright white field of plasma. As I looked at her, I thought to myself, it's okay, she's in stasis lock. That, that plasma enveloped her body with about six inches. I heard a female voice calmly state, felt like it was in my head said she is in stasis lock. It was a confirmation. Thank you, Dr. Greer. Relieved that she was safe, I started approaching the craft for further inspection. The craft and the car, uh, the craft and the car uh, were nose to nose at a 90 degree formation. Uh, if you looked at it from a bird's eye view, it would be in an L shape, nose to nose. The craft was, uh, there was a plasma field emitting approximately 12 inches off of the craft inside this white plasma field. The craft seemed about Trump, uh, approximately 23 uh, feet long. I stepped forward with my left hand extended and slightly reaching out to it. The craft uh, responded to my movement. Uh, this startled me slightly, but I took it and stood still, uh, just in case. Uh, by moving back and pivoting the nose away from my hand like a cat or a boxer, and it felt like a cat to me. Uh, <sighs> Okay, sorry, lost my place. The exterior looked like uh, polished black onyx. As I approached the craft, I noticed ambient temperature, not hot or cold. Uh, I kind of leaned down and touched the craft, and as I swiped my hand up the craft's starboard side, uh, also towards the front of the craft, uh, it was as smooth as glass. However, when I drew my hand back towards me, it felt like shark skin or a cat's tongue. That was followed by a reaction. Um, the reaction followed my hand, and uh, as I, oh, it, it's slightly off here. Uh, so I'm gonna have to do this with my hands just to describe it for you. As you can see here in the, uh, the, the picture, I, I put my hand on the craft like this, and I kinda pushed my head forward. I can't do it here because of the mic but I wanted to swipe my hand up and look at it like I was planing a piece of wood. Uh, as I drew my hand back, that's when I felt that this, this strange texture. It felt like a tiger skin, or a, tiger, uh, a shark skin, or, or uh, like I said, uh, a cat's tongue. As I drew my hand back, uh, pixels jumped off the craft. Uh, they were like micro shavings. I would call it, they, they, they resembled graphene or magnetite shavings and uh, nano, nano sized particles. As I did that, and as I swiped up first, uh, I guess to get back to that, as I swiped up, the craft emitted a tiger stripe pattern up the, up the starboard side of the craft. As I drew my hand backwards, the pixels 
popped up. And as I did, the craft purred. It bellowed through my body. I could feel it resonate in my body cavity. And uh, it was very intense. I felt like I was in contact with a living creature. Yes, sir. Uh, the reaction, f uh, okay, I'm already done with this, thank you. As I, uh, as I drew my hand back, a lattice work opened up underneath. There was a very vibrant color, uh, colors coming out of the craft, the underskin. This was a very thin nano layer, and uh, there was a mesh work, honeycomb style, uh, and it was like a lattice work that was like a frame around this. And beneath that was, uh, well, there were filaments flowing. They looked like a neural network. Uh, I, I tried to see any, any, any uh, universal bus system or any computer systems as the analyst job that I had. I saw none of this. Uh, as I drew the hand closer to myself, uh, trying to peer through all these bright, wicked, beautiful lights that were pinks, blues, and every light color you could think of in the spectrum, uh, I wasn't able to see anything through it. So as I drew my hand this way, I kind of pressed off the vehicle. The vehicle was stable. I mean, this thing was locked in position. It's not like Star Wars when you jump off of something and it moves. This thing was solidly locked in place, solid. I seen a shape right here under my, through my elbow uh, as, I, as I leaned my face down and I could see up into the sky above my car a mirage, which was like a silhouette or a heat foil on the road. And uh, the, the star shimmered in a straight line and, a, and in a very long distance there was a curve. So it looks, seemed to be curved. Either way, right when that ripple hit in the sky, uh, the stars then refixed back into place. I realized I was looking at a cloaking device on a very, very, very large craft that seemed to encompass the whole desert area that I was under. Uh, at that moment in time, I then uh, I glanced and panned my view just to try to get the, you know, uh, fathom the dimensions of this craft. And I saw a giant white, bright white light uh, floating in the sky, and it was a hangar bay door opened. Uh, couldn't see doors, it was just a bright white light. And it looked like a window floating through the sky, maybe even a portal. People might from a distance think, hey, that's a portal, but I obviously knew it was a craft, so this is a hangar bay door. And there was a female uh, silhouette standing there. Uh, at that moment in time, I, seen that, I heard that same voice, uh, and it said very clearly, um, you were not supposed to see that. That, you weren't supposed to see it. All of a sudden, I began feeling a thud, thud, thud sound. Uh, this was a resonant frequency being pulsed through my body. Uh, as I felt this, uh, it increased in speed, thud, 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 thud. It was very rapid. You can see the same type of thing in the movie Interstellar, very similar when he falls through the black hole. Uh, too similar, too similar. Uh, <clears throat> As these, this thud resonated in my body, I felt my molecular or my cells, uh, maybe the quantum level of my body, feel like it was being resonated. I felt like maybe I'm gonna be microwaved uh, or something to that nature. Either way, I seen some bands coming through. I began lifting up off the ground. My vehicle began lifting with me also. As this happened, my body tipped back and I could see the underbelly of the craft. You're gonna see that design right in front of you. Uh, this, the rectangular shape right in the center there looked like a docking socket for an electrical port. If you're gonna take a, you know, a big, big, big uh, uh, male end, um, this would be the female recepting, receiving end uh, for an electrical charger. Uh, to skip through that, there were some very, very, uh, there's some highlighted uh, parts here, um, and as you can read them there, I'm gonna let you read that for yourself, just for time's uh, sake. Uh, however, uh, as this happened uh, instantaneously, I queued in and I was flat on my back, and I was staring up at the ceiling, uh, and my vision cued into a very, very bright white light. My vision panned over, and there was my wife flat on her back on a table. It was smaller than the table I was laying on, slightly lowered, and she still had the same exact expression on her face like she was screaming no. However, however she was no longer stuck in the running position. She was flat. As I panned a little, a little more in front of me to kind of gauge where I was at, and this all happened in milliseconds, guys. This was whole crap. Um, what's happening? So this is a very short encounter here. As I panned over, I saw my vehicle with the right, the right uh, passenger tires end uh, lifted up. I saw some people in some white suits, fully, fully garmented, 
masks with some breathing apparatuses. Uh, they were working on the vehicle. Slightly next to that was a strange blue rack that looked like it could have been an automotive rack, could have had another purpose. That was my quick assumption. As I, as I, oh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, yes, sir. So uh, after that had happened, uh, I saw a female right next to me. She was taking some samples from me. It was a human female. She had red hair. Uh, she had very fair skin. Uh, and uh, after that moment, I also, as I panned over, I could see the window and the desert behind me. I realized we were not in space. I could see the desert floor. I could see the exact two rock formations and one far off in the, in the distance. Uh, so this is pinpointed by, by GPS coordinates. So uh, after that, uh, I panned a little more over, and as I seen this open up, uh, and the bay, the bay door behind her open, or maybe just transparent, and I could see out. Uh, I, I also seen that craft right here docked in the ship, and that came through me after trying to get these schematics down on paper while talking to Michael Scratch. So thank you, sir. This man went through PTSD <laughs> with me. So thank you, doctor. Awesome. I know you're here. You're great.